writing on the Book of Mormon or writing on the Bible isn't going to get me a cushy, you know, career position, right? It's already, especially right now, during the, the, the coronavirus and um, the economic downturn and everything, before this, it was already difficult enough. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Was Joseph Smith aware of the documentary hypothesis? It turns out he was. In our next conversation with biblical scholar Colby Townsend, we'll talk more about Joseph Smith's knowledge and how that may have affected the translation of the Book of Mormon. Check out our conversation. Before we get to that, I just wanted to mention one more thing. As you know, Gospel Tangents has teamed up with the Dialogue Podcast Network. We can now be heard on Lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M.fm, so you can hear all your favorite podcasts, such as the Dialogue Podcast Network, Gospel Tangents, Beyond the Block, and Mormon News Report. So if you want to hear all of us, and we release every few days, so you'll get a lot of updates. So go to Lyceum.fm and subscribe there. Now back to our conversation. Let's, let's go back to your paper a little bit. I, yeah. I did want to go into that in probably in a lot more detail yeah. uh, because I think most people don't even understand it, and so hopefully we've yeah. given a basic primer to that. Okay. But of course, people in Joseph Smith's day mm -hmm. had these same issues. So th this has been old, yeah. and that's what your paper talks about. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so how did Joseph Smith wrestle with this as he was coming forth with the Book of Mormon and the Book of Moses and things like that? Yeah, um, so yeah, in, in my, my master's thesis, um, the, the very first chapter, I talk about um, the development of, of, of European scholarship from the Renaissance humanists of the early 16th century um, all the way up until Thomas Paine. And I do that for a handful of reasons. Um, Thomas Paine's work, The Age of Reason, was, was the bestseller in the 1790s. Um, in it, um, he talked about how he hadn't really planned on writing a book on religion until um, he was older, uh, toward the end of his life. Um, his book, Common Sense, um, was, was one of the main sort of catalysts of the, the revolution, at least um, the, the, the larger push popularly for the revolution and the split um, between the colonies and um, Great Britain. And um, so he essentially, in a similar way to what Spinoza had done, used um, continental European biblical scholarship to his advantage to make an argument that in this new age, the age of revolutions, the age of reason, um, that the Bible wasn't a reliable text for civic and public um, officials to, to base a new constitution Hmm. or a new nation, or new laws upon. Um, which is interesting because the founders, for the most part, pretty much agreed <laughs> um, <laughs> that, um, that it shouldn't be based on the Bible either, that there shouldn't be, um, you know, that there shouldn't be an establishment of religion, that there should be a, a separation of church and state. Um, so um, Thomas Paine's book was massively popular, but at the same time, um, it was massively unpopular. <laughs> uh, everyone read it because, or, or heard it read, um, depending on the person. And either loved it or hated it. Yeah, right. And um, fortunately enough, within Joseph Smith's own family, we have um, a handful of accounts, one in particular, where um, his grandfather, um, Azael Smith, came over to the, the house um, one evening and was angry that Joseph Smith Sr. had gone to the Presbyterian Church with uh, had been going um, with uh, with um, Lucy, mm -hmm. and so he came over to almost literally knock some sense into his son, <laughs> and by almost literally, um, I mean that um, he got into a very heated argument. Um, Azale wasn't really into established institutional religion, and um, thought it was all priestcraft, and you know just that they're trying to use you basically and dupe you out out of your money and and, and everything else, and so. As Azale was, was leaving, he turned, and uh, the door must have been open, because um, he turned and he hurled um, Tom Paine's Age of Reason into the house and screamed at Joseph Smith Sr., essentially saying, read that until you get some sense into you. <laughs> you know, like, stop going to the Presbyterian 
church, <laughs> which is interesting because he was actually successful. Um, Joseph Smith Sr., uh, Lucy wrote later that Joseph Smith Sr. Um, said, like, we should probably stop. I don't want, you know, I don't want this kind of stuff to come up. Um, so it worked. <laughs> Um, wow. Azale, Azale was able to get it, but um, for Lucy, at least, in her retelling of that story decades later, a couple of decades later, um, in her biography of, of her son, Joseph Smith Jr., um, that was a key part. You know, it wasn't just he turned and threw some book or some anti-Bible book or something, because it, it really wasn't anti-Bible, but um, he specifically threw Paine's Age of Reason. That was sort of a symbol of the problems of... of uh, organized, um, institutional religion, but also um, the problems with the Bible and religion that their society, they believed, hadn't really fully grappled with yet. And so um, that leads into um, uh, chapter two of my thesis, um, which I look at the reception of Eden more broadly um, in early America. I look at a handful of different people. I don't look at Joseph Smith or Mormonism at all, um, really, in that chapter. And I just look at how um, Eden played a role in national and local and individual identities, uh, in identity formation. So um, one of those um, is that um, after the French Revolution, um, the, uh, in America there was a very large, and in Britain, very large push against the Jacobin uh, party of the French Revolution. Um, Robespierre uh, was sort of seen as, as the personification of all things horrible about the Jacobins. And so there were, uh, in the 1790s, there were anti-Jacobin societies that popped up all over um, the states. Now, what are they called Jacobins? Um, that's, I think that, um, I'd have to look again, but the specific origin of the name, I think, just um, happened to, to be with um, where they were um, holding their, their meetings. Um, I don't remember exactly why um, hmm. it was Jacobin, but they were holding them in like coffee shops and in public spaces, which is sort of ironic because the anti-Jacobin literature talked about them as meeting in secret and, and in private and, <laughs> and all of that. Um, but uh, yeah, the exact so origin. They were a bunch of noisy look. atheists, it sounds like. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, <laughs> noisy in the in the dark, <laughs> because it it really it, it it became one and the same with like the Illuminati. And you know all of these other sort of dark, secret, you know, organizations. Yeah. And um, when you look at newspapers of that period um, in the late 18th century, the phrase "secret combination" starts to pop up a lot, and um, in particular against the Jacobins. Um, so one of the the documents that I looked at um, in in that chapter. Um, was a review of a recent history. This is in the late 1790s. It was an American review of a French history of the Jacobins. And um, this anonymous author said, this is a really great history. You guys should read it. It's, I think it was like three or four volumes in length. Um, but the author of that history doesn't go back far enough. The real origins of um, the Jacobin party um, go much further. So not only to the Garden of Eden, with um, Satan convincing um, um, Eve, Adam and Eve both to, to eat the fruit, but also in the Council in Heaven, where Lucifer was able to convince um, one-third of the host of Heaven um, that they should all sort of democratize and that they you know, could sort of throw off the government, the system of government in Heaven. And so he was successful in doing that. And so he goes through and looks at, I think, what he called um, the first five or six instances of Jacobinism in, in world history. And it's all mm. biblical history. And um, he pinpoints all of those as specific examples of, of Jacobinism, uh, which is really, really fascinating because you get um, a similar um, account within the Book of Moses that goes all the way back. It's not Jacobinism per se in that way in the Book of Moses, um, but a narrative sort of motif, a key, I guess, a part of the narrative of the Book of Mormon um, is the destruction of the Nephite civilization. And that's brought about through secret combinations. The Gadiatan robbers and a handful of others all keep pointing back, and even in the Book of Ether, the destruction of their civilization, all points back to this idea that Lucifer, um, in the Council, in, uh, in a 
I don't know if they call it council in heaven technically in the Book of Mormon, but um, ha, uh, taught Cain, um, actually. So this wouldn't have been the council so this in is heaven. In the Book of Moses. Book of Mormon, sorry. This is where I'm getting myself mixed up. So in the Book of Mormon, it goes back to Satan um, making a promise with Cain, an, an oath with Cain, um, that he could murder and get gain. Isn't that in the Book of Moses? It's, it gets there. Okay. But it's also in the Book of Mormon. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, Cause, so, because that sounds more like Book of Moses to me. Yeah. The Master Mayhem. I mean, I've been talking with right. Claire Barris about right. masonry and yeah. Master Mayhem, Master Mason. Yeah. And so it's interesting to hear kind of a different perspective on these secret combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So in the Book of Mormon, that secret combination is what brings down um, the, the entire civilization in two different civilizations. So in Ether, you have a really important story about um, Jared. It's not the brother of Jared. It's a, much, it's a later. So how you have multiple Nephi's. Um, the daughter of Jared, um, who um, her, her father um, had been able to get rid of, of his father, the king, and be king for a little while. But then his brothers were angry at him for what he had done by putting his father in jail and not allowing him to be king. So the brothers came in and, and sort of cleaned up the home and got him kicked out, so he was exiled. And his daughter comes up to him and says, why are you so sad? Like, don't be sad. We know how we can do this. We, can, we know how we can get you power. Um, haven't you read in that, that really important book that we brought over um, from the old country, basically, that, um, um, that Satan had made this, this pact, this oath with Cain, and that he was able to murder and get Cain? That's all that we have to do. So just read the, those texts. And so um, she comes up with an idea that Jared would um, approach this man named Akish. Um, she would dance for him. Um, and this should sound familiar too. Mm -hmm. um, she would dance for, for Akish and please him. And then he would ask Jared for her hand in marriage. And then he would do anything um, at that point. And so they did that. And he said, bring me the king's head. Uh, kill him. So Akish goes and does that, and then they have their own little secret group that murder and get gain, and murder and get gain, and then that leads to the whole and destruction. And the parallel, I guess, is it sounds very similar with the John the Baptist story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's in the Book of Ether. Um, so you have that happen there, and then all throughout the Book of Mormon, you have these little nods toward the secret combinations and the oath that Satan had made with Cain. Um, so in my... In my thesis, I essentially look at that to, and say, as far as anti-Jacobinism is concerned, that anti-Masonry is extremely important for understanding the development um, of the Book of Mormon. But um, anti-Masonry didn't just pop up. Uh, there was a much broader context, and that there was a much broader literature as well. Um, Thirty years before um, um, the Book of Mormon was being dictated by Joseph Smith, so in the late 1790s, you already had a lot of this this literature um, that that has a lot of these similar ideas um, and similar themes, similar language um, that you would you would find in the Book of Mormon, you know, only a couple of decades later. So that's key. I think that that's really important. That as as scholars continue to go forward and as I continue to do research, I'll you know keep looking at that and looking for other really interesting connections. Um, but even more importantly, the main argument that I make in my thesis is that the book, the book of Mormon sort of just alludes to this story. It's an extra biblical account um, of Cain. Um, if you just read the text of Genesis, Cain is angry that, um, that the Lord um, accepted his brother Abel's offering, but there's no explanation. There's no explanation of his thinking, but he goes out into the field with his brother and he murders him. Um, then you have the, the important account of, of um, um, God coming down and you know, asking him, where's, where's your brother? Am I his Am keeper? I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, it, you, you, know, you, you don't have this story about Satan coming over to him um, and making an oath and saying, no, go and kill your brother. You can get gain. You can... You know, do that, and then this is a secret combination. This is a secret thing that we're going to do, and that throughout the rest of your life, you can keep killing people to get gain. And if you, you know, keep passing this down generation to generation, 
can work out pretty well for you. You don't have that um, in, in the text of Genesis, but you have it alluded to throughout the Book of Mormon. So my argument, um, and I try to make this as carefully as possible in my thesis, is that um, after Joseph Smith dictated the text of the Book of Mormon, that when he went through and revised the Bible, there were a handful of different things that came up in the, in the process of dictating the text of the Book of Mormon that he then edited into the Bible. The one that scholars had already noticed before, but there still isn't really a paper on this, um, was editing 2 Nephi 3 into Genesis 50. So Joseph's uh, prophecy of Joseph, Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, when they got to Genesis 50, um, in the, the, a little bit later um, in the process of revising the Bible, um, they copied the text from um, the Book of Mormon into the JST from 2 Nephi 3. So, I'm extending that a little bit further um, by saying that he also did that same thing at the beginning of Genesis in the, what's now the Book of Moses. Joseph Smith himself never would have imagined a standalone text called the Book of Moses. Um, he was more imagining the full text of the Bible, probably, um, but uh, like a revised text for his new translation, um, sort of like what you see with the Community of Christ, what they ended up actually doing in the late 19th century. Um, but um, so my you're talking about with the inspired version of the Bible, exactly. So they've replaced yeah. the Book of Moses with the Genesis. Is that is that correct? So what they what they did, um, I think that the first publication was around 1867. Okay. Was they went through and took the actual manuscripts of Joseph Smith's Bible revision project, the JST, and um, compiled all of it together, and then published the, their official Bible as the edited version of the Bible that Smith had edited. Right. So. Um, that's probably more like what Joseph Smith would have had in mind for his whole project, to have a full standalone Bible that was revised with all of those materials. But was he done? He wasn't done, was he? Did he he, he said finish? he was done. Oh, he did say he was mm -hmm. done? Yeah, in 1833, um, he and Sidney Rigdon both wrote a couple of letters. Um, they announced that they had completed it. Um, I think that at that point he did think he was done, but this is a... Uh, something I haven't really published on and haven't done a whole lot with yet, but I think that the Book of Abraham actually disrupted that pretty substantially. I, th I, I view the Book of Abraham as the Book of Moses 2.0 uh, in some ways. Oh, really? <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, because he goes through and revises some of those same chapters at the beginning of, of, of Genesis in, in different ways. Because yeah. at that point, 30, you know, 1833, he hadn't studied languages yet. In 1835, his whole world gets shifted as far as religion and understanding history and texts is concerned, because he starts to actually study Hebrew. Right. So I think that that was a major shift for him. So I think that if he had the ability in 1833 and 1834, which he didn't, uh, they couldn't. They could barely publish the Book of Commandments uh, in 1833. Well, yeah, the press <laughs> got destroyed. That didn't. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it would have been a little bit difficult to <laughs> publish an entire revised Bible. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I do think that he did finish in 1833, um, and he said it, um, hmm. but it would have taken a lot more editing and revising and, and doing that kind of thing. So. And so then 1835 is when the Book of Abraham and the Mummies come through Kirtland. Right. And, okay. Yeah, so he dictates at least the first part um, of the Book of Abraham and then goes on later, but I don't engage with any of that in my thesis, right, right. but I only go up to... Um, really the end of 1830 okay. uh, in my thesis. But to mainly argue that um, Smith, and I sort of described some of this earlier, sorry, but that Smith um, recognized after the publication of the Book of Mormon that there were certain things that were alluded to in the text or even quoted fully, like Genesis 50, 2 Nephi 3, that um, needed to actually be in the Bible. Whether that was consciously or subconsciously, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not going to try to read his mind. But the main thing is, that version of Eden that's not in the Genesis account, that is in the Book of Mormon, was then revised and edited into the text of Genesis for the JST. Hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with biblical scholar Colby Townsend. 
In our next conversation, we'll talk about a famous story in the Book of Mormon. Remember when Nephi went to return to Jerusalem to get the five books of Moses? Did those books exist at that time? The most, the, the most conservative um, attempts to understand when the five books came together as five books, it would have been um, really the you know, early um, return from the Babylonian exile, and probably a little bit after that. So 500 BC. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on facebook.com slash gospel tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at gospel tangents. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.